today we'll be talking about uh, gene therapy and cell therapy, and specifically as a retina surgeon, um, some of the delivery strategies. That's kind of my interest and in how to get some of the these novel treatments back to the back of the eye for patients who have uh, unmet needs in common retinal conditions. Um, gene therapy really has been born uh, in the retina space with a lot of credit to doctors Gene Bennett and Albert McGuire in Philadelphia. They, in, in combination with Spark Therapeutics, really established the first approved uh, in human gene therapy. And there's a couple ways to think about gene therapy. Uh, one is a, a gene replacement, and we see that for inherited retinal diseases. And another way to think about gene therapy, the second way is to insert a gene that then encodes for a therapeutic in the eye itself, a biofactory approach. We'll dive into that. This is a disclosure slide, and we do a lot of clinical research at Will's Eye Hospital. And these are companies involved in uh, cell and gene therapy, and, and I've highlighted them for you here. Uh, a lot of credit to many of the collaborator teams at a variety of these um, in this ecosystem, including my partners uh, at Mid-Atlantic Retina and Will's Eye Hospital, Regenex Bio team, Gyroscope team, Lineage, Cell Cure Sciences, ClearSide, Biosciences, and Oxular. I'd like to um, give a shout out to Regenex Bio, who are uh, sponsors of this program today. It's been a pleasure working with all these groups. And as we think about gene therapy for uh, common retinal diseases, actually we're on the second generation of gene therapy clinical trials for wet AMD, for example. And we've improved viral vectors and improved which transgenes we're selecting. And our obligation is not only to improve the vectors and the transgenes and the protein products that are therapeutic and the biofactory approach, but also to improve our precision and consistency in delivering these medicines. And that's um, maybe surgical in the operating room, or as you'll see, um, there's some promise for in-office use as well. The strategies involve going to the, getting uh, interventions to the back of the eye, and the familiar way is to do a vitrectomy like you see here on the left, and then use a small micro cannula to deliver to the back of the eye therapeutic, whether it's a cell or gene therapy. That's the most familiar way, that's a surgical method. Another way that we developed to try and uh, <clears throat> obviate the need for creating a hole in the retina, when you create a hole in the retina, there are two things that can happen. One is precision of dosing can change, and also you can get um, egress of the intervention out. And for example, in some cell therapies, we've seen uh, membrane formation on the macula. Finally, uh, there's a evolving technique that is has a very big advantage of being office-based instead of going to the operating room. And this is a supracoroidal injection. And there are a couple companies working on devices and some companies that are working on therapeutics. Um, I'll talk about a few of the programs. Uh, and I think my take-home messages are, uh, there are a number of ways to get to the back of the eye, as I just described. Uh, some in the operating room, some in the office. And this biofactory approach is being validated. And we have validation in this particular study for neovascular AMD. This is a Regenix uh, 314 wet AMD study. I'm going to show you the phase 1-2A results. And because this is kind of a delivery talk, we'll show you some of the videos. On the upper left is my uh, one of my fellows working on a heads up 3D monitor and 3D glasses doing uh, this surgery, vitrectomy and delivery to the subretinal space. So this involves using a vitrector to remove the vitreous and then the med one microdose cannula with surgeon foot pedal control and, and calibrations on this one cc syringe. So we can deliver 200 microliters under the retina uh, and no special steroid drops or uh, no special steroid or immune suppression is done. If you think about the volume of viral vectors, we're talking about 
10 to the 10th or 10 to the 11th. So it's we're talking about 100 billion viral vectors. Um, these eyes in the Regenex bio study are amazingly quiet. On the right, you show you see evidence of the biofactory approach working. That is dose dependent in these cohorts in the initial phase one to two A, dose dependent protein production of the, the transgene, essentially ranibizumab. And on the bottom right is a swim lane graph of some of these previously treated patients who um, on the left of the vertical there, you'll see the, the frequency of their, their need for anti-VEGF injections. And then on the right, you'll see uh, a market reduction, clinically meaningful reductions in the need for injections. That is a durable treatment effect. Let me show you a video here. Uh, this is uh, in the operating room. And what you're seeing here is we're drawing some fluid out of the eye to test for antibodies to the viral vector. As it turns out, whether or not you have antibodies to this AAV8 vector is not relevant, probably because the subretinal space is immune privileged. Here you see a vitrectomy being performed, and those white particles are steroid particles that we use to help identify the clear vitreous gel. This is the micro cannula that we test outside the eye, and we put it in through one of our trocars, and as we come down, you'll see the shadow of the instrument get closer to the instrument itself, and then as it touches down, I'll hit on the surgeon-controlled foot pedal, and a very slow controlled infusion of, of the transgene, 200 microliters, 10 to the 11th. So 10 to the 9th is a billion, 10 to the 11th is on the order of hundreds of billions of viral vectors are delivered. We've learned that um, we should be delivering these vectors um, inferiorly uh, to avoid uh, pigmentary changes that you can see uh, that have been observed in a variety of gene therapy trials. And what did we see? In, 42 subjects, we saw stable to improved anatomy um, in cohorts three, four, and five, where there was a meaningful effect um, uh, in protein production. Uh, we saw, uh, and we have data now out to three years, um, we saw stable to improved anatomy. We measure uh, the macular thickness with an OCT, and we see on the bottom right uh, in gray, bars, gray bars that showed um, <clears throat> pre-treatment frequency of injections annualized. For example, in cohort three in the middle, there were seven injections annualized. And then subsequent to the treatment, um, the reductions in the need for rescue injections went down to about two to three injections. And because of these positive data, um, it, this was really the first clinical trial to really validate this concept of a biofactory approach. Gene therapy, not to replace a mutant gene in an inherited retinal degeneration, but a common disease using uh, gene therapy techniques and surgical delivery. And now there are two pivotal trials comparing uh, Regenex 314 to monthly ranibizumab or to bi-monthly aflibercept. And, and this is an ongoing trial and very exciting uh, across the United States and Canada. <clears throat> That's one delivery method. And the other delivery method that we developed really was born from uh, a cell therapy clinical trial sponsored by Janssen. And what our aim was, was to deliver uh, to the back of the eye without creating a hole in the retina. Well, how do you get something under the retina without creating a hole in the retina? Well, you, if you come from the front, like we did with the technique on the left of a vitrectomy and a retinotomy, you're going to have a hole in the retina. But if you come from the back, take a microcatheter, pass it along the suprachoroidal space, and then come up under the retina, you could deliver something subretinally without creating a hole in the retina. And that's what we aim to do. Here's a cartoon showing the traditional vitrectomy approach showing the idea of some of the uh, intervention escaping there, creating imprecision and dosing, uh, and also the potential, for example, for cells to come out and cause epiretinal membrane formation. Here's a cartoon 
animation. So it's a scleral cut down and then a catheter in the suprachoroidal space. And then you come up under surgeon visualization with that micro needle that you see on the slide right, inject in the subretinal space and then retract the needle and come out. Uh, it's a concept that we did a lot of um, iterations with a lot of design engineers, uh, a lot of surgeons, animal surgery, um, testing, and this is an evolved system that um, has now been FDA approved. And this was the one of our original ideas of access to the subretinal space without creating the retinati. This is a super choroidal microcatheter approach. Um, Scrotomy up in the, in the center, uh, cannulization into the suprachoroidal space, <clears throat> sliding that microcatheter to the back of the eye, needle advancement in the subretinal space, and then cell delivery and then closure. I'm going to show you a um, side by side video of an animation and then a surgery that I did for a patient with geographic atrophy. So now we're moving to other conditions, other common conditions that are potentially amenable to the biofactory approach. Here you can see a cut down through the sclera, and we're not going into the eye, we're going into the suprachoroidal space and passing the microcatheter through these um, sutures that serve as kind of stay sutures, and the catheter goes into this potential space. And as we see it go back, we see it kind of like a groundhog under, under, under the retina and RPE, and then we advance a microneedle inject saline first to create a bleb, and then switch the line to your intervention. In this case, it was a cell therapy. There's an air bubble to know we're in the correct space. The instruments on the right where you can switch from saline to cells. And then voila, you've got subretinal delivery without a hole in the retina. This um, device has evolved <clears throat> and a lot of credit goes to the Orbit Gyroscope team now affiliated with Novartis. And it's FDA approved, has been used in one cell therapy trials, also being used in a gene therapy trial uh, for atrophic AMD, not wet AMD, but the advanced drive form. And in this gene therapy trial in the, in the gyroscope program. This is the focus gene therapy trial. What we're seeing is um, really a whole variety of strategies trying to manage atrophic AMD. And in this particular strategy, it's leveraging the observations that geographic atrophy may progress as a function of dysregulation of the immune system that's hyperactive. And so this strategy uses an AAV2 vector. Recall that in the Regenix program for wet AMD, we used an AAV8 vector. This AAV2 vector um, encodes for a complement factor I, which is essentially a break on the complement system alternative pathway. It does this by sequestering this key component of the pathway, C3. And this is, um, we can measure bioactivity by measuring some of the breakdown products of C3. And if CFI is the gene product is sequestering this key player, then we see less breakdown products as a indicator of biologic activity. In this focus, Geographic atrophy trial by gyroscope, um, phase one, two, open label GT005. There have been uh, seven cohorts of subjects, some of which have been done and delivered this viral vector AAV2 uh, CFI uh, transgene by the transvitreal approach, the approach that I showed you before, and others that are being done with this suprachoroidal approach to the subretinal space in the operating room. Here's a animation showing you some of the evolution of the device. This is the second generation. And it's pretty cool. Uh, there's a magnetic pad that allows you to hold the needle advancement knob 
uh, in any position that you want so, the, so that the microcatheter uh, is oriented correctly for coming into this, uh, through the sclerotomy into the suprachoroidal space. There's a syringe with precision dosing um, and a lot of, lot of uh, little refinements, a microneedle geometry. Initially, the microneedle was coming up and we weren't getting into the subretinal space. So we changed the launch angle of the microneedle and the materials um, to improve that. So let me show you another uh, <clears throat> suprachoroidal video. This is the first one I showed you was for cell therapy. This is for the gyroscope gene therapy. This is, uh, these are some sutures we're working on um, using a hardware device instead of sutures, which would make it a little more efficient. We're cutting down through the sclera. Remember, we're in the operating room. Our goal is to get into the suprachoroidal space. And you use this, this blade. It's about a three millimeter incision across um, eight millimeters posterior to the surgical limbus. And this is something to make sure that there are no scleral fibers that will inhibit passage of the microcatheter. And then we orient the device outside the IUC side by side simultaneous video. Check that there's um, patency of the line, <clears throat> feed it from external view, put in a chandelier light. So we're not doing a vitrectomy here. We're using a chandelier light to view in the back of, eye, of the eye. You need lighting, orienting the catheter and there you see the needle emanating and magnification coming through into the subretinal space. It's a little scary. Um, it looks like it's perforated the retina, but that's what it looks like. And then we inject saline to make sure we're in the right place. And then we switch the line over to the gene therapy to deliver this complement uh, factor I inhibitor of that overactive complement system. And this is a patient with geographic atrophy that you see down on the bottom left with an autofluorescent image showing basically a, a black hole uh, where the macula should uh, show some fluorescence from RPE. And we close and we pull out the, uh, <clears throat> the chandelier light and close the external of the eye. And this is uh, a phase one, two study that's led to um, evidence of safety and uh, bioactivity we've seen by less breakdown products of C3. And we're looking at this in two groups of patients in a phase two larger trial, 75 subjects with the particular CFI mutation and 180 subjects that are geographic atrophy irrespective of the mutation with different doses being looked at. And that's ongoing now, the Explore and Horizon study. So gene therapy, suprachoroidal to subretinal approach, FDA approved um, operating room. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, one technique that would have a big advantage because it could be done in the office. And that's the suprachoroidal approach and this was is with an injection in the office as you can see on the on the image on the right uh, where you see the teal green this is an idea to use a specific suprachoroidal injector to with a short needle to deliver um, an investigational agent into the suprachoroidal space that that will then dissect posteriorly towards the target tissue which is the macula region the delivery advantages of suprachoroidal uh, injection are that number one, it's office-based. Number two, it's targeted because you'll be adjacent to the tissues. You'll be adjacent to the choroid, the RPE and the macula. It's compartmentalized kind of like a depot. Uh, and it seems to be bioavailable. We've seen this with steroid, um, with steroid uh, studies in uveitis, and we're seeing it in um, some preliminary gene therapy work as well. I'll show you some evidence of that from a gyroscope, from a uh, Regenex program. This is a cartoon uh, showing suprachoroidal injection. Um, this is an animation, uh, excuse me, a live video 
of a clinical trial patient. There are two needle lengths here. You try the short needle length and try and uh, orient the syringe perpendicular to the globe with some gentle pressure to dimple the globe and then inject. If the short needle doesn't work, you go to the longer needle. This is the design, a refined design of the suprachoroidal uh, injection system. This is the clear side system. There are others. Uh, this one's very nice and allows injection of up to 100 microliters capacity. It's calibrated so you can see 25 microliter uh, increments down below in the teal box, you can see the short needle. Uh, this is more nuanced. Retina specialists are, we do a lot of intravitreal injections, which are quick. This is a little bit more nuanced and takes a minute or two um, to get this uh, done. So it's a different experience for the patient, but the patients um, have done really well. Very safe, very good safety profile. Hold the syringe perpendicular. This is um, my partner, Mike Cliff, is doing a suprachoroidal injection in the <clears throat> Regenix program. Let me know when you're done dosing, Dr. Kufus, and I'll do the 30 second count. A little audio um, by, uh, by Jesse. You, you'll, it's infrared camera, so you'll see if it's in the suprachoroidal spray, a spread of that purple 10. temperature, colder um, gene therapy in this Regenix 314 suprachoroidal injection. And we're looking at suprachoroidal injection in a Regenex wet AMD program and also in a diabetic retinopathy program. Now, this is a really interesting idea, I think, particularly for the diabetics. We're in the midst of, you know, the other pandemic that's going on is not an infectious pandemic like um, SARS-CoV-2, but this is a di diabetes mellitus pandemic around the world. 10%, 11%, um, 12% of the population having diabetes mellitus and maybe 35% of the population pre-diabetic. And anti-VEGF strategies for diabetic retinopathy have shown efficacy for reducing a mechanism of vision loss that is diabetic macular edema. But they're also showing um, the ability to take uh, a stage, a more advanced stage of diabetic retinopathy with a lot of hemorrhaging and findings in reversing that, uh, at least from a fundus photographic appearance. Um, and this is one of the scales that we use to grade diabetic retinopathy on the left. You see mild changes to moderate, and they're numbered 35, DRSS 43, DRSS 47, DRSS 53, and so on, as you see more severe diabetic fundus uh, manifestations, bleeding, leakage. And we're, we're attuned to showing patients pictures of their eyes. They may come in and say, Dr. Ho, I, I'm not having any problems with my eye, but they may show up with a DRSS 53, like you see towards the right, where they're at, they're on the edge of a cliff and they're at risk for significant vision loss. And the problem with a diabetic working age patient is that it's hard to sustain injections and injections and injections. It's hard to take off work. It's hard to pay that copay. It's hard to make a retina appointment when they've got other medical comorbidities and have other medical appointments. It's hard to get childcare because they're working. These are the many issues that cause loss to follow up with diabetic patients and therefore a durable, enduring biofactory approach is particularly uh, attractive for patients with diabetic retinopathy. And in the <clears throat> preliminary, these are small numbers uh, in the Regenix program on the right, we're seeing two-step regression turning the, the clock backwards to less severe disease on photographs uh, in the Regenix suprachoroidal program. That's similar to what has been seen in the ranibizumab or Lucentis monthly and the aflibercept um, bi-monthly programs. 40 to 50% reductions 
when you have significant diabetic retinopathy at three and six months. So very kind of encouraging, uh, good safety profile to date. Um, and the summary of the phase uh, two altitude regenics superchoroidal program, office-based, uh, very well tolerated, no inflammation. And, um, you know, we'll see. We'll see how this goes. We're excited about this. A one-time in-office injection of gene therapy uh, to have durable, long-lasting improvement in diabetic retinopathy severity, reducing risk of vision-threatening complications would be very attractive uh, in light of all the things that, that make it hard to be compliant when, you're, when you have diabetic retinopathy. And so at least for um, our sponsor, again, I'd like to thank Regenex. Um, there are multiple programs going on, um, including a pivotal subretinal operating room delivery of RGX314 um, for wet AMD. We're seeing a supercroidal approach um, for uh, in the office for wet AMD and also diabetic retinopathy and the supercroidal to subretinal approach for cell therapy programs and for uh, geographic atrophy gene therapy program, the gyroscope program. Just show you that the nothing really stands still when we're talking about delivery. One of the fun things is looking at and evaluating different new devices. This is uh, an Oxyalumis uh, device that has an illuminated microcatheter so you can know when you're in the supercroidal space. It emanates after you do the needle injection and then it emanates so you can see it. This is Mark Desmetz showing you um, this illuminated microcatheter. We're working with them uh, on a couple programs uh, in there. You can see delivery, a needle insertion in the supercoil space, and then there it is, verification that you're in the correct space. So precision and consistency of dosing uh, is one of the themes today that I'm, I'm highlighting uh, and that is continually to being involved in this, um, in this ecosystem of uh, instrument makers, design engineers, surgeons, uh, and of course the patients that allow us to do this. So we've talked about gene and cell therapy. I can tell you that um, I think gene therapy for common retinal diseases in the biofactory approach uh, is is promising. We need to do more work uh, in larger uh, trials, randomized trials, but we have multiple um, companies that are looking at this, Regenex Bio, Adverum, and others. Um, the traditional standard vitrectomy retinotomy approach is time-tested and the most familiar. Um, the supercroidal to subretinal microcatheter approach is more nuanced uh, it is FDA approved, more, more surgeons are learning this and may be particularly amenable um, for cell ther therapy delivery in my, my view, because um, there's no opportunity for egress of the cells in the intraocular space. Um, the suprachoroidal injection that I just showed you is, has a real ad potential advantage because it's office based and the instruments uh, are evolving. Uh, it's really fun. Um, to, to be involved and to see us moving to new therapeutic options, hopefully in the not too distant future for common diseases. Um, I'd like to really thank um, Hunter and Larry who I've been communicating with at Orbis. I'd like to thank Ron Polanke, uh, who's a colleague and a friend uh, who encouraged me to get more involved with Orbis and I think I, uh, this is a nice start, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here with everyone. Thank you very much. I think we're going to move to an opportunity for, for me to answer questions. Okay, we, we, have a, we have a few questions here. How much would be the cost difference between these novel methods in comparison to traditional anti-VEGF injections? When, when can we see these methods coming into clinical practice, especially in a developing country such as India? That's a really good question. Now, I think that um, 
you know, when you're talking about gene therapies, um, you know, we've, well, let's, let's go, let's go to what's, what's out there now. The Luxterna gene therapy program for um, labor congenital amaurosis is very expensive uh, on the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars. I think uh, more, more towards a million dollars per, per dose. Um, these kinds of therapies, I think, let's say for wet AMD or diabetic retinopathy will <clears throat> be less expensive than that. And they'll have to come in at a, at a point where um, cost of injections over time will be similar to cost of a, maybe a one-time delivery. So if you take uh, $750,000 for um, Spark Luxterna and bring that down to, uh, I don't know what the number would be, to be honest, I'd be just purely guessing $100,000, $200,000 for delivery. Um, that would still be very expensive for a developed country, um, but we need to establish these things first and then, and then figure out um, how to get them everywhere. The next uh, question is by Nihal Youssef. As an ophthalmologist is in a developing country, how would one be involved in advanced trials? Um, that's a really good um, question. And as some of the trials go global, uh, I would say to be in touch with the um, companies that are doing these programs and to try and get involved in that fashion. Uh, Shola Data has a question. A vitrectomized diabetic patient had routine intravitreal Osrodex injection in an eye with diabetic macular edema of around 400 to 500 microns thickness. Second injection, the Osrodex was misdirected to the macula with a subretinal hemorrhage developing immediately. The OCT scan, however, showed a significant reduction of the macular edema by second day. Unfortunately, she had long-term poor vision to which the vision returned with hemorrhage clearing up within a few days. What are your thoughts? Uh, we don't like to see um, an Osrodex hit the macula, but I'm happy that the, that, the, that the macular edema went away. So when you're directing an Osrodex injection, I'll often try and direct tangentially rather than straight to the back of the macula. I'll have the patient seated up and then deliver inferiorly so that gravity will undermine the ability of the, of the Osrodex missile, if you will, from going towards the macula. Cheng Ming Li asks, is intravitreal injection for gene therapy a possibility? And the answer is yes, there, there are a couple of programs working on that. At Verum's working on it for macular generation. Uh, and they, are, they stopped for diabetic uh, macular edema uh, because of uh, inflammation and some safety issues. They're going to lower doses. Uh, Murtaza, Murtazavi Fard asks, how many times gene therapy are needed in such chronic diseases? The hope is one and done, um, but we don't know the answer. Boniface Mandashona asks, anti-VEGF strategies don't seem to address the primary driver of neovascularization ischemia and DR. How do we see gene therapy addressing ischemia in the near future? We need to, I think you're right. It, ischemia is often a, a pathologic mechanism <clears throat> or initiating factor. And so you can think about going higher on the pathway like <clears throat> uh, above VEGF, like <clears throat> the HIF factor or other ways to uh, strategize to affect the microvasculature that gets undermined in the capillary beds when you have diabetic retinopathy. Olakan Aramu asks, there are, a number, there are a number of genetic research going on in Africa right now, especially through H3 Africa Initiative. Are there ways these genetic research in ophthalmology can involve the African population? We definitely need to uh, continue to diversify um, those patients that have access to um, all these novel therapies, not just novel therapies, but um, diversity and access are important. And I agree with that. Pat Otieno 
asks, how old is the youngest patient you have treated with these new therapies? <clears throat> and what are the rates of the clinical success compared to the traditional treatments? Well, some of the treatments that I've treated in the young patients are, <clears throat> are the inherited retinal diseases patients. We're doing some collaborative work with University of Pennsylvania on patients with labor congenital amaurosis, not the Luxturna mutation, not the spark mutation, but others, and I've treated teenagers. Uh, <clears throat> is unilateral gene therapy effective for the contralateral eye um, from Mort Morteza, Mortazvi, Fard? Um, that's a good question. People have made that observation in the GenSight trial for <clears throat> Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy of gene therapy in one trial affecting the other side. Fascinating, not well understood. Um, systemic transfer or through the visual optic optic chiasm and pathways. Um, the answer, your question, is it effective? The answer is, is unknown, but there are some observations of contralateral effects. So the next one is as the sclera thickness might vary for a suprachoroidal approach, how can one adjust? or actually avoid getting deeper towards the peripheral retina? There is variation in scleral thickness. So the, the needles that are used are 900 microns. And then if, if you can't inject, in other words, you feel resistance, um, you go to the longer needle. You know, it's a good question. Thousands of patients have been injected or thousands of injections have occurred over I think hundreds, maybe thousands of patients. And really the, the idea of perforating an intravitreal injection has, has been rarely seen. Um, the, the oxular cannula that I showed you that illuminates is a nice way to know you're in the right spot. I kind of like that. Um, but using just the needle lengths themselves and the techniques um, have been pretty safe uh, for Superchoroidal injection. All right, and the next one is how old is the youngest patient you have treated with these new therapies? And Teenager. Teenagers. Teenagers, and what are the rates of clinical success as compared to the traditional treatments? Uh, for some of the treatments in the youngsters, it's been, um, there is no alternative treatment because they are inherited retinal degenerations. All right, next is, is this gene therapy effective in AMD with advanced geographic atrophy? Uh, we're working on that. That's what I was trying to show uh, in the gyroscope program. Is it effective? Not sure yet. Next is what is the material injected in the subretinal space in AMD and what is it in DME? Anti-VEGF transgenes. Next question, is this gene therapy effective in cure for colorblindness? No. All right, uh, next is, are there oral gene drugs for the retina? No. All right, and the last open question is, um, seeing into the future treatment possibilities, we hope cost will allow us in the developing world to access these treatments. So more of a comment than a question very much a theme um, and a focus for Orbis, most certainly. So I agree. You know, the, um, the videos um, that I've shown were collated uh, across a variety of clinical trials. And um, it's just a reflection of how much activity is going on for, for unmet needs. We have some treatments for wet AMD, for example, but trying to get better in terms of um, even better vision or less freak, better in terms of less freak, less burden of treatment since patients have to come in all the time. Um, and another is, did you encounter any allergy slash reaction or side effects? And side effects are very important. Uh, part of uh, the initial assessment of these therapies. And <clears throat> um, some of the intravitreal gene therapies have seen inflammation. The eye has some immune privilege in, uh, as compared to the rest of the body. 
And I think there's some relative immune privilege probably greatest in the subretinal space. That is, you can inject something foreign there and not elicit an inflammatory reaction. Then maybe in the suprachoroidal space would have some relative immune privilege, but maybe less than subretinal. And then finally, intravitreal, I think, may have the least immune privilege. And we've seen some, um, some programs where there have been uh, inflammatory responses. So we monitor that carefully. I can tell you that in the Regenix subretinal program where we've had the most experience, um, those eyes are amazingly quiet. They do not require systemic steroids or immunosuppression, just the usual topical post-surgical drops. Thank you. And then one other one that just came through is um, how to get in touch with companies conducting such trials. Um, and how could you guide fellow ophthalmologists in developing countries? Um, I think education is one way we can guide to give people a sense for what's going on. Programs like, like this through CyberSight that are uh, focused uh, or more globally focused, defocused, uh, are, is one method to keep people up to date. Um, you know, communicating with the companies themselves. A, lo a lot of programs, you know, are are focused kind of where they are. So uh, it, it makes sense that they might focus more on, for example, sites in clinical research sites in North America, but <clears throat> some programs will need to go global because they're looking for approval globally. And that's when, you know, having your name in there by communicating with the companies themselves uh, could be helpful. And any unexpected excess prolifer proliferation of cells or rare possibility of metaplasma or tumors? Metaplasia? No. Yeah, no tumors, but we have seen in cell therapy trials, epiretinal membrane formation um, and, and more, even, even uh, on, on rare occasion traction retinal detachment. So cell therapy has its own challenges because the cells can not form tumors, but um, can form membranes on the surface of the retina. And then a follow-up question was, how about endophthalmitis following these treatments? I uh, have not seen that to date, but that is obviously a possibility and something we, we consent for when we're doing an invasive procedure. I, re I really wanna thank uh, everyone again for the opportunity and um, Wish I could see you all. And um, Larry, Hunter, Rom, specifically my contacts there. Um, thank you so much.